Oh, terrific. Thank you uh, for the kind introduction and for the those people who are tuning in. I very much uh, appreciate your time. Uh, Tech Capital is focused on uh, building uh, valuable companies that can make a positive impact on people's lives around uh, university discoveries. And that's the, uh, the focus of the business. And there's sort of three points to keep in mind. It's a business that transforms discoveries into products that people can actually use that could improve their lives. And to do this, we uh, not only have to select uh, the intellectual property, screen them, acquire them, but also build companies around them and assemble teams, directors, management teams, and provide initial funding. And when we do this, we always try to have some star power management. While the technologies may be new, uh, and that impact, impacts, you know, obviously the potential of the company, it's always handy to have uh, knowledgeable hands running those businesses. So we couple new technologies with experience management. Uh, we also provide services to about 250 universities around the world. Uh, we found that the process that we put in place for screening technologies and evaluating its potential was of value to the universities themselves. And most of the university customers that we have uh, use the service year in and year out and have for a number of years. And perhaps most importantly, on a financial basis over the last five years, uh, we've shown uh, growth of our net assets, which is our most important metric and growth in profitability as well. So the business is working and uh, our most recent results that were published for uh, full year 2021 were the best in the company's history. Again, our focus is on growing our net assets over time by commercializing university discoveries. Our, our net assets increased 108% period over period for 2021 uh, to $68 million, which is a record for the company, which is 48 uh, cents a share, which is also a record for the company. Our total revenue is just north of 29 million, most of which came from uh, unrealized gains in our portfolio and some revenue increases uh, in our services. And our profit was just over $26 million for the year, which was a significant uplift to over the 7.7 .7 million from the prior year. And our diluted earnings per share was uh, 21 cents. So uh, overall, um, a splendid year for the company financially. And just a sort of a view from the bridge, again, our, our most important KPI is uh, net asset value and net asset growth, and in particular, returns on invested capital. And that's what our business is about. We invest capital into these early stage discoveries and hope to produce returns. And when we do produce returns and monetize them, part of our business plan is to uh, declare special dividends and share a portion of those monetizations with our shareholders. And you could see over the last three years, our net assets have grown significantly and as has our, uh, our profit after tax. Uh, in particular, also, if you notice, we have a returns on invested capital percentage of over 40% for 2021. This is a uh, stock uh, graph, obviously, of, of tech capital over the last 12 months from uh, from two days ago. And uh, we're up slightly uh, for the 12 month period, although the value of the company has increased significantly during that period. I think what, what really makes us unique is that we're able to uncover these gems that have been developed at universities around the world. And to do that, uh, we've built a large electronic network, it covers about 162 countries and about 4,500 research institutions, where we can cull th through those institutions' properties and see what's available in areas that are of interest to us uh, that have not only been invented, but have been disclosed by those institutions as being available for sale or license. And we think this really gives us sort of a leg up on other investment trusts in a sense, 
that we're really able to go to the source of the intellectual property, which is our, the cornerstone of our deal flow. And once we see a property that's of interest, of course, we have to screen it, uh, which is no easy task, especially for an early stage innovation. We tend to look at innovations at technology readiness level six and above. So there is already proof of concept. The basic science has been done, but there's still a lot that can go wrong with the new innovation. We have about 60 science advisors on board that can help us review these technologies and give us a sort of a brutally honest take on uh, whether it's, you know, it has the potential uh, to make a positive impact in the market. Again, these are not guarantees, but these are all attempts to uh, mitigate investment risk. And in fact, the size of our network, you know, spanning 162 countries and 4,500 research institutions is a way to, to mitigate adverse selection within, the, within the, the pool of early stage technologies. So from, from that process that we put in place, the very inception of the company, uh, we have built four portfolio companies. Each of these companies were established by, by Tech Capital from a clean piece of paper. We incorporated them. We found the initial technologies. We hired the initial directors or management team members. And we put in the initial capital, which is usually a couple of million dollars. Uh, so they really are in-house creations, which is also different from other you know, investment companies where you're normally making investments in existing entities. We're creating the entities from scratch around university technologies that we think, if successful, can make a positive impact on people's lives. And in fact, that's the duality of our mission. Returns on invested capital, but also making a positive impact on the lives of the customers that our portfolio companies serve. So the four companies we built are Belluscura, Lucid, Guidance, and Solaris. Belluscura was the first one. We currently own about 14% of the company. And uh, the company was floated last year. I'm sure many of you are fully familiar with it at this point. What's interesting, though, and it speaks to the conservativeness of our mark-to-market approach under IFRS, we had Belluscura on the books a year ago at $2 million. At the end of 2021, based on the public float of the shares that we held, uh, the value of our shares were t was $22.7 million which accounted for a large part of the uplift for 2021. Not all of it, but a significant portion of it. Uh, uh, Belluscura makes uh, respiratory devices, portable oxygen concentrators for people that need supplemental oxygen, such as COPD patients and others. Uh, Lucid is the second company uh, we founded. It's a smart eyewear company. This is eyewear, proper, <clears throat> proper prescription glasses and sunglasses coupled with Bluetooth technology that allows you to access most of the features of your phone. So with Lucid Glasses, you could listen to music, take or make calls, call an Uber, access digital assistants like Siri, Google Voice, Alexa, and Bixby, and others, as well as correct your vision and protect your eyes from sun. And so we think uh, the eyewear industry, which is enormous and, you know, obviously, uh, quite well established over 400 years is going through a major transformation that in the near future, most if not all eyewear will become smart eyewear. Similar to what's happened to the watch industry where most new watches sold are now smart watches. Uh, so uh, that's what Lucid does. It makes smart eyewear and the business is growing very rapidly. Uh, it introduced its first commercial product in January, 2021 after a number of prototypes and uh, uh, Lucid has thousands of customers around the world, has over 600 five-star ratings on its products, and it had a book value at the end of 2021 of $17.3 million, completed two crowd funds. And we've, we've previously announced that we filed a registration statement uh, with the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States uh, to have the uh, the, use, the U.S. Operating Division of Lucid, which is Innovative Eyewear, uh, be listed in the U.S. and trade under NASDAQ. And so we are waiting, obviously, for the markets to be a little less choppy 
but our hope is that we will consummate an initial public offering of innovative eyewear shares uh, this year uh, in the near future. Uh, in addition, uh, our third company is Guidant. And uh, Guidant makes software primarily for improving the safety of autonomous vehicles. And in many, many jurisdictions of the world, it's, you're able legally to operate an autonomous vehicle without a driver or a safety driver, but you have to be able to hook it up to a remote monitoring and control center in case the vehicle gets into trouble, gets into an accident, or is inoperable for one reason or another. And there have been many instances of this happening. Uh, in the state of Florida, it's the law that you can operate an autonomous vehicle, but you have to be able to hook it up to a remote monitoring and control center. And Guidant has built the first remote monitoring and control center for autonomous vehicles in Boca Raton, Florida. And in fact, just recently, and this was previously announced, Guidant has won its first commercial customer, uh, which is a major transportation authority for the city of Jacksonville, Florida. So uh, Guidant is producing software as a service for, for a monitoring and when necessary, controlling autonomous vehicles remotely. And we have a, a guidance on our books for $18.1 million at the end of 2021, which is uh, the current value of the company, which is currently doing a private round with uh, institutional investors. The fourth company is Solaris, which is Latin for salt. Solaris owns a patented process for producing what we believe to be the world's smallest edible salt crystals. And uh, this is very uh, important and a very valuable technology in our view. It's important because the number one cause of premature death in the world is cardiovascular disease. Uh, 17.9 million people die each year prematurely of cardiovascular disease. And it's been estimated that about 70% of these individuals uh, have deaths that are preventable uh, through diet and exercise. And in particular, when it comes to diet, the number one factor is to reduce excess sodium consumption. Right now in the United States, uh, the average uh, U.S. citizen uh, consumes about 3,400 milligrams of sodium a day. Uh, and the U.S. FDA has reckoned that if that number can be reduced to 2,300 milligrams a day, it would save between 25 and 50,000 lives a year in the U.S. alone. So uh, one way of doing this is to reduce your sodium consumption in the foods that you eat. Uh, that can be achieved primarily by either making foods less salty, uh, which definitely achieves reduced sodium, but also re achieves reduced sales. So the snack food and other prepared food companies are not that keen about reducing the salt in their products. Uh, alternatively, you could provide an, a low sodium salt or an alternative salt like potassium chloride. And a number of companies are doing that and have tried that. And because of where potassium uh, resides on the periodic table, it has a metallic flavor. You can try to mask it, and cover it up with other flavors, but the tongue is exquisitely sensitive to salt. And it really, it's very difficult to produce a salt artificially uh, that doesn't have that uh, metallic flavor. Uh, so uh, as a result, although some snack food companies are using potassium chloride to reduce their sodium and, it, and that works, it doesn't produce as flavorful or as a full flavored product as using normal sodium chloride. Even so, the market for potassium chloride as a salt substitute is about a billion and a half dollars. So it is a big market and that's because it's absolutely needed. Uh, what Solaris has in its microsalt product is the first full flavor, all natural, non-GMO kosher sodium chloride salt, but with a crystal size that's 100 times smaller than regular crystals, table salt crystals. So as a result, you need to use less because the dissolution rate of the small crystals on the tongue is so rapid that the brain feels like it's getting more salt than it actually is getting. How much more? about twice as much. So you need to use about half as much microsalt to produce the same level of saltiness that you would with traditional table salt. And that means you can cut sodium 
consumption by about 50%, and in some snacks and other foods, even more than that. So uh, Solaris is a portfolio company that owns Microsalt. Microsalt Inc. is the uh, U.S. operating division of the business, uh, and the business is doing very well. We'll get into this in a, in a few moments. Just recently, we've changed the name of Solaris, Solaris Limited, which is the UK company, to Microsoft to reflect our one name, one brand strategy as we bring this product global. So these are the four companies that make up the lion's share of the value of Tech Capital's portfolio. So again, uh, Belluscura is uh, an important company, respiratory device company. Uh, they make a, a wonderful uh, portable oxygen concentrator that's very lightweight, very small, which is important because many people who have the need for supplemental oxygen, you know, have, have certain other deficiencies in terms of musculoskeletal strength coordination, et cetera. But there's another feature that the Belluscura product has uh, which is we think terrific and that is it's modular so as the, as a person's disease progresses instead of having to get a bigger unit with with a higher rate of airflow you could just change the uh, filter the user can change the filter themselves much as you would update um, memory on your laptop if you had an application that needed more memory so this allows you to reduce the cost of owning and operating a portable oxygen concentrator over the lifetime of the patient and that allows more people to afford portable oxygen concentrators, which we think is a wonderful achievement of the company. Uh, the company uh, developed the product, patented a, a number of, te of the technologies that have gone into the product, uh, and has gotten uh, FDA clearance last year, and then subsequently listed the company on the AIM under the ticker Bell. So the company is doing well, uh, they're making and selling portable oxygen concentrators in the U.S. market. And we think uh, the market is, depending on, on your source, it's somewhere between 3 and $5 billion over the next few years. So even winning a small percentage of that market uh, would enable Belluscura to become quite a sizable enterprise in our view. And this is the uh, stock performance of Belluscura from its listing at about 45p to roughly twice that a year hence. So the stock, even in a very choppy, difficult market, has performed quite admirably. And we think there's plenty of room to, to roam for this stock as, as they increase their market penetration of this device. So in short, Belluscura, which was originally created by Tech Capital, has built a world-class portable oxygen concentrator it's the first one that has been cleared with modularity by the US FDA, and they're, they're in production and they're selling and distributing products. And so they've done the big job of going from a new technology that people need to a device that people need and can buy. And, and because of its unique features, we believe is much more affordable than other products of its category on the market. So my hat's off to uh, the Belluscura team for having done the heavy lifting of building this successful company. It's a wonderful proof point also for tech capital of how you can go from a clean piece of paper, some vibrant new technology to a valuable new product that can make a difference in people's lives. So Lucid and its US operating division Innovative Eyewear is all about making eyewear smart. And uh, we think this is the future of eyewear uh, eyewear has been on the market. It's been sold for over 700 years and in the current form factor, at least 400 years. And, and precious little has changed in the frames of glasses. There have been some meaningful changes in the lenses uh, and having uh, photochromic lenses and uh, multiple focal point lenses, uh, progressive lenses and better materials. Uh, but in terms of the frames, very little has changed in 400 years. And uh, Lucid is all about making that change happen. And, and their view is that uh, for smart eyewear to go mainstream, it has to look like designer eyewear, come in a wide variety of sizes and, and uh, other design variants. It has to be priced like designer eyewear, like 
uh, roughly 150 to 200 dollars a pair and it has to be easy to use and lightweight like designer eyewear uh, traditional designer eyewear weighs about one ounce and the lucid smart glasses weigh between 1.1 and 1.4 ounces so uh, they are genuine substitutes for regular glasses but they do so much more they allow you to main, remain connected to your digital life without having to take your phone out of your pocket. So you can, with a hands-free methodology, listen to music, talk to people, send a text, call an Uber, you know, do so many of the things you do on your phone right through your glasses, and the sound quality is crystal clear. And so it's quite an achievement, and the pricing is the same as regular glasses. The base product comes in at $149. So we think uh, Lucid is on to something. A number of other companies have entered the market, which we think is, we think is good. Competition is healthy. And uh, Lucid is growing their business. And uh, we think uh, they'll be quite a successful enterprise over time. They've also introduced a social media program that's operable through the glasses called Verb. And so we're very excited about that as well. Now, Lucid is available at lucid.co, their home website. It's also available on six or seven other websites like walmart.com and dicksportinggoods.com and bestbuy.com, the largest electronics retailer outside of Amazon in North America. And now uh, Lucid glasses are also available in more than 200 optical stop, uh, short stores and kiosks uh, around the country. So we think there are many channels that Lucid Glasses can be sold in and will be sold in in the future. We're very excited about the business. Currently, we own about 81% of Lucid and its operating subsidiary, Innovative Eyewear. The final company uh, that we'll talk about is uh, Solaris. Uh, Solaris uh, makes these uh, ultra-small uh, salt crystals. And it's an interesting thing because with microsalt, you can really significantly reduce the sodium consumption, but many uh, large companies uh, didn't quite believe that it was possible to do that with a good tasting salt. And so as proof of concept, uh, microsalt uh, started to make crisps with the microsalt under the Salt Me brand, which is a house brand of, of uh, microsalt. And People loved the crisps and they started selling them on Amazon to rave reviews. And uh, Kroger, which is the largest supermarket chain in the United States, picked them up and originally wanted them in 800 stores uh, last November and has, has subsequently expanded, them, expanded the store count significantly. And now uh, the salt meat crisps, which was just proof of concept really, is now in thousands of locations throughout North America. It's growing rapidly. And they're going to do line extensions of other snacks. Plus, they're going to start selling uh, salt shakers with the micro salt. So you could have, you know, a low sodium salt on your table, not only in your home, but also in restaurants and food service locations and hospitals and hotels and other places. So we think... Uh, Microsalt is, uh, you know, really doing a terrific job now. They've had their first bulk orders of sales in the United States of the Microsalt itself. Uh, they're in discussions with numerous leading companies, both retail distributors and food manufacturers around the world. And we think, uh, like Victor Hugo has said, uh, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And the time has come for a healthy good tasting, low sodium salt. And Microsalt owns the exclusive rights to this technology. And we're very excited about the future of that business. Recently, uh, we had a venture fund from Spain uh, make a $400,000 investment into Microsalt at a 29% uplift over its previous uh, valuation, which was on our books for 2021. And so we think this is just the beginning of the appreciation of the value of, uh, of the company, Microsalt, 
which right now we ha we have on the books for just a couple of million dollars, but we think it's worth considerably more than that and will be worth more than that in the future as it gains market traction with leading food resellers and snack food companies around the world. And as is our way, we like to bundle star power management uh, with these vibrant technologies. And in the case of Solaris and Microsoft, we have a terrific CEO, Rick Uni, who has run a uh, snacks company for 32 years that was twice listed on the Inc. 500 list of uh, 500 uh, largest private companies in the United States. And he's assisted uh, by, uh, by Javier Contreras, who's worked as a production manager for Clorox's food business, Masterpiece Barbecue Sauce, which was a billion dollar food business. And Mike Marotti, who uh, was a, a vice president at Unify, which is the largest food distributor in the United States. And so uh, we have we have assembled a team that is, is deeply knowledgeable about making and selling foods, snack foods in particular. And that's what you need to penetrate a large market like the snack food market or the low sodium salt market. Uh, similarly, we have a very capable board and on the board we have Eduardo Sushin, who was the brand manager for Pringles, which is the fourth largest snack food business in the world. We have Steve McCready, who was, who was previously the head of product development for Albertsons, the second largest supermarket chain in the United States. And Dan Emery, who is in charge of sales for Pilgrim's Pride, which is the largest uh, chicken manufacturing company uh, in the U.S., and now worldwide and he brought that company in sales from over 800 million to you know significant billions of dollars in sales so this is a extremely knowledgeable board combined with a knowledgeable management team and finally we have guided which makes software for the remote monitoring and control of autonomous vehicles and delivery devices and we're very happy to report as we've mentioned that they've been onboarded their first commercial client, which is a major milestone for any early stage business. And their first commercial client is not a small client. It's the uh, Transportation Authority for Jacksonville, which is the largest state by area in the United States. So they have an enormous transportation authority. Uh, also, Guidant is making uh, uh, a new generation of shock absorbers that generate electricity for adding or recharging uh, batteries for electric vehicles, and they, they own the intellectual property for doing this. They've also added significantly to that intellectual property through in-house development. They've tested, the, they built prototypes and tested them, and they're continuing to test them, and they're working with a number of large companies that are evaluating these products for potential inclusion into their electric vehicles. Guidant also has, uh, as is our way, a, uh, an extremely knowledgeable, capable team. Guidant is headed up uh, by Harold Braun, who was previously CEO of Siemens Nokia. Uh, when he ran Siemens Nokia, they had 4,000 employees to give you a sense of the scale of the business that he's been able to successfully operate. Uh, and joining Harold on the board is Johan Janitian, who is uh, really knowledgeable about the automobile industry. Uh, he was previously uh, executive vice president of General Motors and president of the Cadillac Group. He's currently chief operating officer of Volkswagen North America, which is an enormous company in and of itself. And he has a lifetime of experience in running some of the leading uh, automotive marks in the world. And joining uh, Johan and Harold is Dan Grossman, who was COO of Maven, which was the mobility company for General Motors. And uh, also he was uh, one of the um, early developers of Zipcar, uh, which was sold subsequently to um, Avis Budget for about $500 million. So Guidant also has a extremely knowledgeable, experienced board of directors. And so when you couple early stage technologies with knowledgeable teams, you know, you can often achieve better results than you might otherwise achieve with an early stage management team. 
So in summary, Tech Capital commercializes university discoveries for its own portfolio, and we assist universities in understanding the value of their own discoveries. We've built a high value portfolio uh, that we think has very significant growth prospects near term. And we have a proven track record of growing our net assets and growing our returns on invested capital over the last five years, and we are profitable. And so I'll leave it at that and I'll open the, uh, the floor to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Excellent timing, yeah, because we've got plenty that have been coming through as you've been speaking, which uh, is, uh, as we were saying earlier, um, is a, a good sign. Um, first question here, and I think this is a, a very interesting one, um, brilliantly articulated, but I, I'd be surprised if more people hadn't had this thought as well. And it's around the role of institutional investors. So, you know, you're looking to bring them in as potential, you know, investors in these companies. And they're asking, isn't some of the value lost there? Because those institutional investors will be looking to go in at a very, very early stage and to carve out a big part of the profit for themselves. Well, it's um, it's it's somewhat of an art uh, when you're when you're building early stage businesses, you have to make sure they have what they need to complete the journey or be as successful as possible on the journey. And that includes bringing in capital as well as capable management. And uh, we help them to the extent we can. Uh, we like to own as much of these early stage businesses. Initially, we own 100% of them. But over time, of course, we're diluted as we bring in capital beyond the capital that we're contributing. So you have to allow the most important thing is to enable these companies to maintain the momentum and the growth that they need to make an impact on the markets that they're facing. And we don't want to uh, limit those companies by the, uh, the amounts of capital that we can invest in those companies. And so when, when we reach a level where we feel that we've invested as much as we can in a particular time frame, we and get if those companies need additional capital, it's our job to introduce them to other sources of capital to make sure they can continue on their journey successfully. Because, you know, time is vital, especially when you're talking about commercializing new technologies. There's an arbitrage there. At some point in time, those new technologies are not new. So you want to cover as much ground as you can in the market as quickly as possible. And that means you have to bring in external capital. And yes, you have to tolerate the dilution of external capital. But the idea is to build as big a pie as possible. All of our companies face billion dollar plus markets. So we don't think we're running out of market value anytime soon. And if any of these companies reach their, their true natural sort of success level, they should be very significant enterprises that should produce good returns on invested capital for tech investors. Mm -hmm. And presumably it helps as well bringing the names of some of these institutional investors on board, you know, is a tremendous vote of confidence in, in these companies as well, you know, when this early stage. Yes, it de-risks them, for mm. sure. Excellent. Um, and this, um, you, you just spoke about billion strong consumer markets, but all three of these. Uh, so there is a specific question four, about, four. Four. Four, sorry, four, uh, uh, four. about Microsalt. So in terms of working with major consumer brands, I mean, you know, you, you, you were bringing names like Walmart, et cetera. I wonder perhaps if this person was thinking about, um, you know, brands like McDonald's that are actually taking stuff and then selling it as, as uh, you know, as their own food rather than Microsalt as a product as such. Yes, we think uh, the market is, is certainly... Uh, twofold. Uh, the B2B market for, for a good low sodium salt substitute is roughly a billion and a half dollars. And But really what Microsalt is, aside from it being a good low sodium salt substitute, it's just a better salt. And the salt market is a lot larger than a billion and a half dollars. The salt is ubiquitous. It's basically in every food product, both prepared foods and, and early stage food ingredients. Uh, so uh, the market for salt is enormous. And what's happening now, it's really exciting. I mean, Microsalt is on fire. They have, they have uh, inbound requests from the largest food and food distributing companies worldwide. And they're working with them and they're working with them carefully and precisely. But uh, it's amazing the number of companies that have called upon Microsalt in the last 
three or four months. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it really snaps one's head back how fast this is coming about. And I think a large part of that is due to the timing of, you know, not only the change in the FDA regulations requiring reduced sodium contents in foods for food manufacturers, and there are similar regulations in other countries, but the fact that the, the microsalt is in crisps that are being sold nationwide it's the first rollout of full flavor, low sodium salted products in the world. And it's being done by the largest supermarket chain in the United States. And what that has telegraphed in our view to the market is that the water is safe. And not only is the water safe, people are enjoying the product. The ratings on Amazon are really good. The sales on Amazon are doubling. Uh, the uh, the growth in the and the resales uh, in the in the stores uh, through Kroger are doing very well, and they're being sold in 200 other stores besides Kroger. And all of this has happened in 18 months, which is like uh, instantaneous in the food industry, you know. So it's very exciting. And then the salt shakers, uh, we think that's going to be an out of the park home run. It's going to be sold in supermarkets all over the world in the near future. And it'll be sold in different sizes and mixed and blended. Microsalt blends very well because the salt crystals are so small and because it's so well micronized that it's really an ideal blending agent for other spices. So, you know, we think Microsalt is on the verge of becoming a very significant company. We think it'll be a listed company in the next year or so. Uh, we're very anxious to make sure that it has all the resources it needs to really dominate the market that it's in right now. And we think it has a very strong intellectual property position as well. And uh, we can talk more about that in the future. But uh, we think Microsoft is really a very compelling investment. Uh, we own uh, roughly uh, about 70, 73% of the business right now, considering all the dilution from the other investors that have come in. And we think that's an enormously valuable, undervalued asset on our books right now, also in our view. Uh, but uh, we think it has the potential to really uh, produce oversized returns in the next couple of years. So we're very excited about it. And we also think it has the potential to make a positive impact on people's health worldwide because of the unfortunate ubiquitousness of cardiovascular disease. Hmm. And just in the last the last two minutes you've got, you mentioned the IP there. So one of the questions is asked, is, is there a prospect of any of these portfolio companies potentially being brought out by industry leaders? Someone else had also made the link with what Guidant are doing, you know, with what the likes of Tesla will be looking at. So I, mean, I assume that's something that tech must have considered at some point along the line. Yes, I think uh, we're, we're not building the companies to own them indefinitely. We're building them to bring them to market. And uh, the, the two major ways that we see doing that are through listings, public listings, or through trade sales, obviously. And so uh, both are available. Uh, and, you know, listen, uh, public listings don't abrogate the potential of trade sales, you know, because the uh, there's so much capital in the market that if you're a major player whether and you like the company, whether it's public or private, it doesn't, doesn't slow you down much if you want to buy it. So uh, we're doing what we ha have to do to make sure these companies are able to maintain the momentum, seize the momentum, seize the growth, and, and make their marks in their industry and earn their market share. And uh, for us, it's usually a listing because we have access and the ability to do that. Belluscura was the first. We believe Innovative Eyewear, the Lucid Operating Subsidiary, will be the second one. And then following that will be Microsoft. Uh, which we intend to probably list in the UK. And then following that will be guidance, which will either be sold in a trade sale or listed. So it's, we have the optionality and, uh, you know, the market will, uh, will present opportunities to us as these companies demonstrate the traction with the customers in the marketplace. Excellent. Well, um, Cliff Gross, thank you so much for such a um, detailed presentation there. I think given that we've got four, businesses in there. I think we certainly learned a lot about them and, and, you know, their future prospects. And thanks for taking some of the questions from the floor as well. well it's my distinct pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity.